I liked my skinny hands. Hello and welcome to another episode of D&D Valiant Odyssey. I'm your DM, Aaron, and I'm sitting around the table with Bayagram, Felix, Ben Gore, and also Mr. Howrod. Today, guys, we're going to start our session off by giving our name, our race, our class, and you guys are going to tell me that if your character was a vegetable, what vegetable would they be? Roll to see who goes first. So I play Howrod, the uh, bugbear slayer. I've changed the name now. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, he's a level five hill dwarf barbarian, and uh, if he was a vegetable, he would probably be a turnip. Please explain. Turnips, they're tough, and they uh, <laughs> and they squat round things. I don't know. Perfect. That makes sense to me. Yeah, let's go with Bengal now. Hey, hi, I uh, play Bengal Goldstone. I am a level five fighter, and I am a hill dwarf. The type of vegetable I'd be. A potato. Very nice. On to the tabaxi, Felix. The tough one, probably maybe a carrot. Why a carrot? Do you like that? Yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with Bagram. All right, and I'm Bagram, level five Eladrim rogue. And if he was a vegetable, it would be a tomato because he's not sure if he's a vegetable or or a fruit. I get where you're going with that. <laughs> He doesn't know which side of the table he belongs on. You got it. Mm. Okay, so last time we left off, you guys were in a little bit of trouble with Zilor. You guys had to uh, escape after breaking Felix out of his holding cell, having been wrongfully accused of the murder of Orn Stone. He's a moiterer. So using Bagram's knowledge of the Unseen and the maps below the city, you guys were able to make your way through them to the Odyssey Guild where you're now held up. Not before encountering Melnan Wargon, his band of Griffin Riders, and a variety of his uh, city guard and watch who you promptly fucked up. <coughs> Did I miss anything? Uh, the fact that none of us can hide except for me. Oh, and we uh, encountered an uh, eye tyrant. What you believed was an eye tyrant, yes. Yeah, so you got lost in the sewers. You uh, got yourself turned around, and in doing so, two of the party members felt fear beyond belief. And uh, a massive eyeball haunted your dreams. So we're going to cut in now. Three days later. Three boring days. You've spent your time at the Valiant Odyssey Adventurers Guild. And in doing so, the walls have gotten monotonous. The smell of mahogany no longer hits your nostrils as you walk through the area, as you've acclimatized to the scents within the building. You watch as heroes come and go. Every time they exit the door from the tap room, you get a sense you wish to be out there too. As we cut, it's currently night time. We cut to Bagram. Bagram asleep in his quarters. A loose sheet upon your person. You look up at the bell that had been signaling you endlessly from Zen. By looking at that, you can see that it is still disconnected, but that hasn't stopped this individual from contacting you, his desperate search to solve this puzzle. As you close your eyes, sleep finally taking you. You feel rested. And you begin to dream. In your mind's eye, you see a swirling vortex of black smoke. You're in the middle of it, in the calm of this storm. As it swirls, you can feel a pain in the pit of your stomach. You see the wisps of smoke begin to dissipate and as it does, you can see faint green lights permeating above two of them looking down upon your person as this smoke completely dissipates you look across the landscape and you can see that it is barren buildings that once stood broken reduced to rubble 
the people that used to live in this place withered, emaciated. You watch as the wind blows by and parts of their body just dust off into the distance. You look down at your own hands and you watch as they begin to shrivel. You turn it over and you can see the back of your hand, every bone showing. The only light you have is from the green lights above. The pain in the pit of your stomach gets heavier and heavier. It's a hunger. It's a hunger that you can't satisfy. You begin to take steps through this environment and as you do, each step is an effort drawn out. You begin to get angry. Each step you take in anger. Looking around at this place, this barren landscape, a puzzle you cannot solve. And from that anger, you begin to get fearful. You watch as the dark smoke swirls once more, surrounding you. And as it wisps you up, and it becomes more violent in its make, it swirls and swirls and swirls until you get lifted off your feet. And as it lifts you off your feet, you awaken in the middle of the night, a dark room. You're back in the Odyssey. Looking around this area, you hear the sound of footsteps soft in your room. Roll a perception check. Started very well. Uh, Nat one plus five. Okay. Six. It seems sourceless. You're unable to determine where it is, but you can definitely hear something soft moving in this space. What do you do? Quickly get up and grab out my dagger, which is my sleep directly beside it. And just kind of say, who's there? You move through this room, dagger in front of you, your eyes slowly adjusting, and you can begin to see as a result of your dark vision. You can see the moon pouring through the night windows. And as you look down at your feet, after taking a few steps, your feet hitting the rug, you can see a ginger cat. Looking at that cat, it looks at you. On its collar, you can see a piece of paper scrolled. Reach down and grab, uh, was it trying just slowly not to frighten the cat, but want to grab that scroll, that paper. You relax the dagger, and as you lean down, as you do, the cat rolls onto its back. You take the piece of paper, a small scroll, unfurl it. In handwriting familiar to you, it says, Where have you been, Zen? I basically just kind of puzzle it over. I'm like, what do you mean? Where have I been? I've been here. I've, I've seen him earlier. Roll an inside that, check. Yeah, uh, 10. He's been bothering you a lot about this puzzle. And this is his latest attempt to procure your attention. Whether so. it's a, a direct emergency or whether he's even had a breakthrough, you're not sure. But the bell didn't work, so he sent the cat. I kind of, I sigh and I I've, I've reckon that he's probably going to be awake. And I'm up now. Um, what time is it? You're not too sure. As you not look at the sure. moon in the sky, you look out at the city below and you can see through the windows, even though this is a an arcane depiction of the Odyssey, the actual city outside is mirrored almost perfectly throughout the windows and you can see that there is not much life happening within the city, which you know to happen around the early morning hours. Okay. Well, it's the early morning hours. I've gotten a little bit of sleep at least, so I actually just kind of just leave my room and head out towards... Zen and just kind of knock on the door, see if he's around. As you make your way towards his room, you grab the handle, open it, and inside to the left, you can see an incredibly messy sprawl of belongings. You know to belong to Zen. You can see papers all piled up on each other, various different arcane devices, knickknacks, bed completely unmade. You look towards the right, another bed. A bed that did belong to Turi. The young dwarf that was slain as the Odyssey exploded. You can see her bed still made, her boots still remain. At the head of the bed. Immaculate. Untouched. The room's empty? Yep. Alright. I'm like, nah, stuff this. 
and I go downstairs to see uh, Malone, to see if Malone's up, and see if I just kind of get a bit of a nightcap. Eventually, you make your way to the tap room where Malone definitely is. You can see his tuft of hair. He rarely sleeps these days. And as soon as you come down the stairs, actually, before you even hit the tap room, he says to you, "Tough night, Beagram." Ah, uh, a tough three days. I just uh, there's so much uh, happening here, but at the same time, not happening to myself. I'm just sitting here. Yes, well, it does seem to be hard to be in the middle of it all, but then also on the peripheries. He slides you over a drink of your choice. He knows everybody's drink. He knows everybody's name. And you converse casually. At that, we cut. The early morning hours peeking through the windows of the Odyssey. But for Halrod and Bangor, their morning began before the sun came up, taking this time to train and hone their bodies is in the yard of the Odyssey, they spar. What do you two currently look like as you're facing off against each other? So Halrod in isolation has gone a little bit fur crazy and tried to shave his hair off. Probably is more of a disguise than anything else. Mm-hmm. So he's just got his beard now and a bald head. Very cool. And Bengal? Bengal hasn't really changed much except for he's started to plait his beard, make it a little bit more neat and tidy. Just like his brother? Yep. Oh, that's fucking cute. <laughs> um, and he had a haircut where he's given himself a mohawk down the middle, but a short mohawk. Very nice. So as you two stand there in your armor of choice, you're both holding wooden staves. You look around at this place and you can see that this is a room designed for people to train in their agility and their strength. The sand below you, soft but hard if you hit it. You can see stone pillars of varying size, some five feet tall, some two feet tall, some ten feet tall. Both of you begin bouncing from one to the other to try and get towards each other. Roll acrobatics checks, please. Five. Okay. Okay. So, Bengor, you begin jumping from one to the other, one foot hitting the stone as it does so, and you eventually get to the 10-foot one, making sure you have the high ground. However, Halrod, you begin jumping for the same one, and as you do, Bengor pushes you with his arm, and you only just grab onto the one next to him as you do so. You pull yourself up, and you're probably on the seven-foot stone pillar, looking directly at him with a stave in your hands. It's not fair. You've got longer legs than me. It's not my fault I'm taller than you. Yeah. You may have the high ground, but it's not an advantage when it comes to me. And at that, you guys both swing your staves at each other. Roll, let's say attack rolls. Try and hit each other's armor class. 18. 22. So I believe as you guys are sparring, these wooden staves clacking onto each other. Eventually, Halrod, you swipe at Bengor's feet. And as he jumps, he dodges your first blow, but you immediately bring down the horizontal, hitting him directly onto the head, smacking him in a playful way. Take that, you big brutes. <laughs> I tickled. At that, you go for it again. Roll attacks. 19. 19. Okay, so at this point, you guys both begin clacking these sticks together, and eventually they come towards each other. You're binding them in the middle, and you can hear them beginning to break, flex, and snap. As you both begin to push these closer together, you break apart from each other, swing them around in a flourish. I need you to roll acrobatics checks to maintain your balance. 23. As you push off Halrod, you begin to move backwards, centering yourself. And as you do, you can see Bangor slightly leaning onto one foot, his balance off skew. And as you do, you just get the tip of your stave and shove him lightly in the shoulder. As you do, you watch as he tumbles head over head and lands 10 feet down onto the sand, flat on his back. The air is taken from your stomach, uh, from your lungs, Beng- Bangor. <laughs> That wasn't fair. Much to learn, you still have. At that, you jump off of the podium. Go and give him a warrior's grip to help him up. Your morning training done. Don't think much of it. I spent many time years in the militia, Bengal. You'll get the hang of it. I just need a bit more training and I, I think I can take you. 
Never trust that your opponent's going to be honest. I spent many years fighting goblins and they are the most cunning kings you'll ever fight. They don't fight fair and you shouldn't either. The only thing I find honest is people I can trust. And there's only a handful of people I trust at the moment. Everyone here at the Odyssey is well and trustworthy. And, and hopefully in time, they'll earn your trust. I'll make sure that they know they can trust me. That's it. Just keep what we're doing here. You didn't have to jump in with us to rescue Felix, but you did anyway. You know, you've earned your place here with us as far as I'm concerned. He, uh, he asked me to help. I'll help anyone I can. At that, you begin to make your way out to have some breakfast served for you in the tap room as the sun begins to rise. John, I think we've done some eggs and bakey. I love eggs and bakey. We cut now to one of the tallest portions of the Odyssey Guild. Three days in this building has probably served you the least favorably, Felix. But still, you've taken this time to meditate in the early morning sun. You're sitting on your windowsill of your room. Looking out onto the city, you can see the hustle and bustle of Cadmia beginning. You can see the forge, a large temple to Nicestus firing in this early morning, its orange glow matching that of the sun which comes across the sea. As you look towards that sea, you scan the many ships in the harbour of the inland sea. One of them catches your eye. The eye catcher. Pink sails, rose emblazoned upon it. A hatred fills you. You know a liar is aboard that ship. As that fills you, you center yourself once more, knowing the purpose of your meditation. You look towards the market square, innocent people going about their daily business, unaware of the perils that they may or may not be in. You see in the southwest corner, the Wasonia Institute nestled amongst the mountains, students moving to and from. As you look towards the sky, you can see griffin riders circling. You know them to be city watchmen on their daily patrols. Over the last two days, they've seemed to slow in their approach. You know, a few days ago, they were rampantly searching for you. You do watch, however, as three of them begin banking across the eastern side of the city and park in the cul-de-sac where the Valiant Odyssey Adventurers Guild resides. From the position you watch, you look down to the street, cobblestoned, as three of them dismount. You notice one of them immediately. This one is Melnan Wargon. He comes off of his griffin, removes his helmet, his blonde hair shining in the early morning sun. He removes a scroll case from the side of his hip and he begins unclipping it and opening it, revealing a piece of paper. He moves towards the ruined structure that is the Valiant Odyssey Adventurers Guild. You know you're sitting in the arcane fortress created by Arden himself. And at that moment, you look down at the street and you can actually see Arden Cassian exiting the building. His brown mop of hair pushed to one side, teacup in his hand, you can see the small smoke billowing up from his cup, still hot. He's wearing a cloak that you can see covers one of his hands and as he moves towards these three individuals, you watch as a conversation takes place. Roll an insight check. 13. Looking at this, it's an amicable conversation. It looks like Melnan and Arden have known each other a while. There's a familiarity with their conversation. You watch as he hands a piece of paper. Arden opens and reads it, and as he does so, he hands his cup of tea to Melnan, who holds it for him. He scrolls it up, and as he does so, he pats it onto Melnan's shoulder, and they exchange again. You watch as Arden shakes his head, does a gesture of not knowing, and points around the city. You watch as they begin to become more stern. Melnan moves very, very close to Arden's face. And Arden's shorter than Melnan, so he's towering over him a little bit. But Arden doesn't move. 
He watches a small conversation occurs and the three of these guardmen get on their griffins and fly away. You close your eyes for a moment, centering yourself. And the next time you open them, you hear a voice behind you. How's your morning, Felix? Better than yours, by the look. Just had some visitors. An old friend. Nothing to concern yourself with. Looked like it might have gotten a little heated at the end there. Ah, he's got a little bit of a temper, and... Let's just say he's not too fond of the fact that he was bested by... Four of my adventurers. Needless to say, he's only doing his job. He's a very... He's an honourable man. He's one of the good ones in the watch. It is unfortunate. Hopefully by the end of this we can clear it up. He nods to you and he says, I hope for the same. It's one thing to have the city watch and the guard on your side. But if Melon Morgan vouches for you, that's an opinion that I'd listen to in the Senate and in the watch. We came up together when I was a part of the watch myself. I have some sway with him. But, um... Well, he can read me like a book. Yeah, I believe that he does know I'm here and just doesn't want to force the issue. Well, that's what the paper was. They, uh... It was a warrant for your arrest and your three friends now. As they also assaulted some guards in your escape and busted you out of prison. They believe you to be hiding in this here building, but they didn't have any proof, so I sent them on their way. We may need to find something to do elsewhere. That might be wise. But just know... I look after my own, Felix. You and your allies. I'll do what I can to clear your name and you can stay safe in this sanctuary until the city of Cadmia opens up for you again. Being held up, though, I don't think any of us like it and uh, itching to get back out there. Well, I can tell. Your midnight runs have not gone unnoticed. Sorry. Don't be sorry, just... Please leave my table alone. It's hard to get the claw marks out of the legs. He pats a hand on your shoulder, and as he does so, you watch as the door to your quarters bursts open. As it does, you look towards the door. You can see the beautiful figure of Siraj Saharis. Dark skin, black curly hair. You can see her robe moved around her, and it looks like she's just coming in a bustle. You can see her black staff still glowing blue as if the teleportation spell has still taken effect. You see her, she's flustered. She moves directly over to Arden and says, I need to talk to you, Arden. It's serious. Something's happened at the Wissonia. You watch as Arden looks to you and says, You'll excuse me, Felix. I'll take my leave. And you go as he turns and Siraj says, I don't know how it happened. We, and Arden says, Please, somewhere more private. You watch as they begin making their way upstairs towards his office. Hey, yeah, Felix is bored. Mm-hmm. Can I try and follow them? Roll a stealth check. Uh, 19. Okay. As they turn out of your room, making a left to the stairs upward leading to Arden's office, you watch as they leave the spiral as you stand at the base of the stairs watching them go up. You watch as their silhouettes disappear and then you slowly ascend the stairs stealthily. Do I see is Bergam anywhere downstairs at all? He's in the tap room, which is the floor below. What? Can, at I, the see, moment, can I see him from where I would be from on the stairs? No. So as you look around in this area, your room exits onto the war room where the table is and you look at this stairwell, you look around and you're completely by yourself. Oh, I lost him. No, no. Oh. As in there's no, nobody else oh. around. As you go to make your way up the stairs, you watch at the last minute as the door to Arden's office closes. I like to sneak on and sort of perch up and put my ear to the like if there's a hole or just sort of some like crack at the door. Mm-hmm. See if I can hear it. Roll a perception check. 
That will be 25. Hushed whispers to start with, but you can hear in Siraj's voice passion and anxiety. The words ring from the silence as if a volume octave has increased and she says, it's gone. The tome, it's gone. From the Wasonia, in a godly light, I don't know what happened, it's impossible. Except for divine intervention, you watch as Arden hushes her and she says, please, Saharas. If it's gone, then we need to put all our resources into finding it again and taking it to a place where it won't be lost. You watch as she says, I don't know how this would have happened. The Wasonia has arcane safeguards. There is no spell that could have affected it to make sure that it disappeared. It was before my very eyes, Arden. I don't know what to do. And you watch as Arden says, We'll figure this out. I'll set some adventurers to the task, but I have to make sure that some of my... my more... well, those that are in trouble, they need... They need me first. I'll set them straight and then I'll make sure that this is on my priority list. You watch as Sahara says, Please, I, I'm, I'm beginning to draw the sigils to see if I can recreate what happened. But at the moment, the only thing I can think of is, is that a power much greater than mine, much greater than any mortal being, a divine blessing of some kind, an intervention of the gods, but why, why would they want this book? I just hope it hasn't fallen into his hands and Arden says, don't even, don't even bring that into the light. The things that could happen to this city, if that is the case, it's unfathomable. Please, calm. Level heads will prevail. You watch as she says, you Arden, I, I have to get back to the Wasonia. They'll... I'll have to call the delegates. Goodbye. And you feel this blue flash under the door and through the lock. I'll um, start slinking away then. Yep. Start heading downstairs. All right. As that happens, you hear before you leave, Arden let out an audible sigh. You watch as he's, he backhands his teacup across the wall and smashes against the bookcases. And all you see as you look through the lock is a figure of a weathered and broken man leaning against his desk. His head slumps as you move away. I will head down downstairs to the tap room um, to see if they, who is down there. Okay. As you descend the stairs, you can see that the Odyssey is kind of in full swing. You can see Bayagrim has set up in a booth and he's sitting with a... Uh, halfling woman, uh, somebody you know to be Bira. She uh, she often gambles with Bagram. As you guys begin looking through the area, you also see Halrod and Bengor, who are enjoying a nice breakfast, and you can also see a couple of other patrons that seem to have wandered their way in, being allowed through the arcane door. You watch as there's light music playing as the morning vibe occurs, and the smell of eggs and bakey are on the air. Um, as I come into the room, I'll see if I can get Bagram's attention and sort of signaling to come over to where the other two are. With your passive perception, Bagram, you'd definitely be able to notice Felix standing at the banister. Looking at him, I'd say without an insight check, you can see that he looks a little frazzled, a little worried. All right. I'm, I'm always, even when I'm sitting in the uh, VO building, I just... I'm always kind of with my back to the wall, kind of scanning the crowd. I'm kind of clocking everybody that's coming in and out. Just that, Mm -hmm. that's just part of my character, so. Yep, and you can hear Beer's voice in your ear saying, Bagram, it's your turn. Roll the dice. What are we doing? At the moment, you've been playing a game called uh, Threes. Yep. And basically, you roll 5d6, threes equals zero, and the lowest number wins. 15, 17. Okay. As you roll 17 absentmindedly, you watch as she rolls her dice in front of you, these green pearlorescent things. And as they roll across the table, you watch them almost in slow motion as they bounce. My mind's definitely elsewhere yet. You snap back as she says, 14, I win, hand over the money. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're sure. horrible at this. This is almost like 300 gold I've clocked from you. 
Do you like my new scarf, by the way? Paid it's, for it, on your dollar. It, it looks beautiful, actually. If uh, I probably should have just bought it for you rather than just hand over. Well, you did gold, buy it for me. I suppose that's true. I did. I'll be back tomorrow so, for my uh, for my new set of earrings. I guess I yeah, need something uh, to dress uh, yeah. these babies up. Well, uh, was it after, after three days? I've kind of lost about a year's worth of uh, what I've collected. So, um, yeah, you know what? Basically, another day, and you can have everything. This is the most profitable job I've ever taken. I and at that, you see. Felix, you get up and you move away and she looks to you and she says, come on, Pegram, one more game as you walk away. No, no, uh, I, I, I'm done for today. It's, it's been a very early morning and a, uh, a interesting evening, so I, I'm done. Okay, well, I guess I'll take this gold and go treat yourself. To market, to market. Don't, don't spend it all in one place. If I do, it won't be any business of yours. You watch as she picks up the gold, leaves, out to the door that you so wish to exit. Yep. You make I, your I, way I, I look like, kind of longingly at the door. Hold up a hand. <laughs> <laughs> you make your way over to Felix. He's standing by the banister. Uh, morning, Felix. Uh, morning. Uh, I need to speak with you and the other two. I just overheard something quite concerning. Oh, all right. Uh, well... Uh, they're sitting over there just kind of eating their brekkie. Is, is that a quiet enough place? Or do you want to um, go back to my rooms? Yeah, we might or grab them and go somewhere. Yeah. All right. Kind of follow over as well. They are ravenously eating. Well, actually, do you eat ravenously? Or are you like polite table manners eaters? But no? They are, they are. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. You are polite? No. Okay. We. So, yeah, they're like two bulldogs eating porridge. They're just smashing each other's food, stealing things off each other's plate. You watch as a fork gets flown through the air, and you watch as somebody, um, Halrod basically stabs a sausage as Bengal goes and steals his mug of ale and, ale and chugs it. As you get there, you then look towards your left at the same time, mouths full of eggs and bacon, and you can see Felix and also Bagram standing there watching you both. Halrod, Benny. Not polite, Mr. He, he says with a mouthful of food. Yeah, uh, I don't know what we were watching was polite anyways. You watch as a piece of egg falls from Howard's beard and onto the floor, <laughs> and it's at this moment you also realize that he's bald. Oh. Uh, are you okay? What are you looking at? I am. Do you have a hat or something to cover that chrome plate that you call the top of your head? I don't know. If you want to be stealthy, this is not the way to go about it. He looks majestic to me. I look, I look completely well, different than what I did before. Maybe I could go outside for a change. You, 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 not with that head. The one who's uh, saying I'm sorry, you're, you're the one who stands out like a sore thumb around here. You're not wrong. I mean, the only thing we could do with you is die you like a tiger. That's offensive. <laughs> but I'll let it slide because we're friends. Um, but on... A more serious note, um, there's something I need to tell you both, and we should go somewhere a little more private. Is everything all right? No. Better go with them. Let's go. All right. You quickly finish what was left on your plate, Halrod, as Bangor shovels the food into his gullet. It's at that you guys make your way up the stairs, and you make your way into Bagram's room, who has one of the only... Single person rooms in the Odyssey. Oh, this is nice. What do we see as we enter your room? It's actually really, rather lavish. Um, basically, the the gold that I did not lose to uh, Bera has actually been spent elsewhere over the last while. So you kind of come in and basically it's as my I said a while back, gold is meant to be spent. So yeah, the the bed is kind of it's not just a kind of thin rough linens or whatever. It's actually kind of it's all set out nicely. You see this uh, Bengor. It's uh, elven privilege. <laughs> you oh. can see that there are puffy pillows all through yeah, the bed, some exactly. lavish curtains blowing in the light breeze that is just portrayed kind of, through the arcane windows. Kind of reds and blues and just kind of, yeah, just kind of looking some purples in there. It's too fancy for me. What does it smell like in here? Oh, it, it just it just has a very fresh um, breeze scent mm. to it. Just kind of just like a, just a beautiful, like sunny morning kind of smell. It is filled with the musk of two dwarves and a cat that's been inside for three days as they enter. And then all of a sudden, all basically that that starts, and then basically because of the uh, the arcaneness of the room kind of thing, it just all of a sudden that smell just vanishes and it just comes back to the scent again, disappears. You close the door, and as you do, the four of you seem alone in this room. 
So the uh, guards came by this morning with a warrant for my arrest. Is that Sorry. surprising? I, I'm actually surprised they took three days. Probably only safe because of the relationship Arden has with the girl. However, after that, Arden came to speak with me. Um, and we were interrupted by Lady Sarks. Ah, the Lady Mage, yes. Yeah. Um, she seemed to be in quite a panic, so I may have followed them to listen in on their conversation. May or did? Accidentally? Did. Did. <laughs> did. The tome has been taken. The, which which tome? The tome the, that were... You mean the spirit bound tome that we got from um, from up near Undercliff? Yes. Really? Wasn't that, like, fully protected in the... Apparently it was, and she's not even sure how it was taken. She may... She thinks it may have been some sort of divine intervention. But the Wasonia Academy is supposed to be more secure than the bloody bank. And that's what she's saying. She has no idea what happened and or how it happened. She's the most powerful mage I've really ever known as well. If, if she doesn't know what happened. And she was saying that whatever it was, was possibly stronger than her. Stronger than anyone she knows. Still the work of Delnak. Someone catch me up of all this. Sorry, uh, Sarah Shahara, she's the... Uh, She's a staff major at the Wissonia Institute of Arcana. Right. Um, so basically, like the headmistress over there. And uh, she's a big deal, very powerful. Mm. Um, basically, it's got the most arcane users in the in the world, and it's very heavily protected. The Spiritbound Tome was a book that was spent to be from the gods, and it contains uh, information to treasure troves, weapons, and it's also a prison for the most powerful evil beings that have ever existed. So maybe that's why it's gone then. They didn't want it left down here. They took it back. Well, uh, yeah, they, they've been wanting it forever, but the fact that it was actually taken from this Wissonia, which is fully protected by everybody in it, plus so many arcane sigils and other traps and as well, that's the surprising bit. But right, whoever took it has immense power. This goes for a reason, isn't there? I mean, like, she you, you know as well as I do, Ben Gore, that the gods are half myth these days. She did say that it could have been by divine intervention. So it, maybe not by a god specifically, but someone who is a worshipper. Or has basically a, a, a one power given to them type thing, you mean? Or? Yeah. But well, I'm not really clued <laughs> up in those sorts of ways, so... So a god or a, a titan of darkness? One, one of the two. Wait, you were... Was it Was it you who found it before? We kind of came across it and... Ah, uh, we found it. Yes. We were we were tasked to retrieve it yeah, after, that's the, right. after the Unseen stole it. How did you come across that one? Like, how did you find it? Um, Last time. We, uh... Basically, the Unseen stole it on the road to Cadmia. Took it to Undercliff to have the box unlocked and read by the, um... The, well, the Oracle slash, you know, witch that lives up there. So there's a trail to follow, at least, then. We had to get information from someone. Ah, uh, yes. Does the name Tezanlis mean anything to you? Uh, it's paint. I've, uh, the name sounds familiar, but I have never met him, and I don't know much. Tezanlis is tied in with a lot of the underbelly around here. It, basically, his dealing is that currency is not currency in Cadmia. Information is currency. So he will trade information with people for other information. Oh, okay. I mean, it could be quite possible that he could be tied in with this as well. Should we... I, I, I kind of want to just chase this up on our own. But uh, we, we, are, we, we can't just leave Arden. Uh, we are well, in the lockdown is, at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And Arden seemed overwhelmed after she left. Because... He was saying that as much as he, he's going to send out people to sort this out, he was worried about us and had to work out what he wanted to do with us first. So maybe we can kill two birds with one stone. If we find this tome, would we be basically let off then? Could that happen? No, because I, I still killed... I don't think so. Well, I still apparently killed a guard. Uh, but Stop mass murderer, kill one guard, it kind of levels the playing field doesn't it but in in the sense that we we told them that we had a witness to the thing anyway it's not like they wouldn't involve him we're interested in listening 
It might be just a matter of pride at the moment now. We need to do something beneficial to the gods for them to mm -hmm. save the world, stay the execution. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Well, if we find this tomb, are we doing just that? Saving the world? For the moment, but it is still missing pages as well. I, I have no idea what any of the pages are these days. It's been turmoil the last week around here. Mm. We know Delnak has at least two, three, three. Three. One yeah. of them's one of them's not useful, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, the the, the one that I kind of uh, picked up and moved over a while back is was already used. Mm. So that's a. And I think, well, did they? The Azul uh, or the Deceiver one would yeah, be, still be useful. They, they could still use it to break him out if um, Saharis has locked him away again, or her away again. Ah, uh, yes. And the biggest problem with the Deceiver is we must have taken her on when she was really weak because I've been reading some scripture on the Deceiver. She, wait, would just, just decimate legions of fighters. Well, she was just at work then, wasn't she? Mm. And hungry. What are we going to do, gents? What, are we going to go and just confront Arden with what we know from what Felix said? Well, I believe Arden will probably come to us soon. Because he wants to get this sorted, but he also wants to get us sorted. All right, so we just keep Loki and play well, dumb? We can go to him, but... Do you want to just... I don't know if he's going to be angry at the fact that I was listening in. All right. Do you think he'd just you'd be surprised that you were listening in? I don't think probably. he would be. No. But I leave it up to you guys. What do you think? We go low key, continue what we're doing, and wait for Arden to come to us. I just want to get out of this building. Mm -hmm. Me too. Wait, mm -hmm. I, I yeah, want to get out of here so. as well. Any, anything that will get us out of this building. Why so do you, why do you we, get shaved my head? Go if we go talk to Arden. At least basically that's a chance that we could be sent off to do something. And yeah, then yeah, we're getting out. All right. Well, let's not pretend, let's pretend we don't know anything about the conversation with Saraj first. Yeah, we'll just say yeah. that we're looking for something to do. Mm. Oh, you, or even just kind of that you told us that there's that the warrants out for us now mm. and we can see what Arden says about doing something about that indeed sounds good all right yeah. let's go all right we'll head up to Arden's office all right you go to Arden's office the doors are firmly closed but as you reach for the handle you watch as they creak open by themselves <laughs> as they creak open you walk inside the smell of tea hits your nose and you can see sitting at the desk, Arden scrawling on some pieces of paper and you watch as he has quite a stack. You can see this room surrounded by bookcases, uh, no windows and light, uh, lantern light illuminating the space. There are various leather bound chairs sitting facing his desk and a rug in between them that seems to be, it's quite a welcoming area. As you enter, he says, come sit. I'm arranging some plans to get you out of the city please any gestures to four chairs that magically uh, shift outwards for you guys to sit in do I notice any broken teacup or anything there roll a perception check uh, 21 for you Bayagrim you scan the room as you often do when you enter force of habit and as you do you can see a few small scuffs across the bookcase that weren't there the last time you are in this office it seems like the wood has recently been abrased but no tea no cup almost as if it's been magically clean but that's the smallest little evidence of something that may have occurred perception check uh 10 um you're doing that thing where you hold your elbow and you're looking from side to side <laughs> and your knees are sort of nobbling together it's like when yeah. a dog's done something wrong mm. so like, oh, as, as i go to sit down i kind of go past the bookcase and i just kind of rub it with my fingers if it's like i think it's a scuff or something like that and but notice that it's that it's actually a scratch. Yeah, it's definitely a scratch. And you guys notice Bagram does this, and so does Arden. As you guys sit down on the leather-bound chairs, he says to you, Now, as you know, there are some people in the city that are looking for you for a crime you didn't commit. Now, as a result of that, I've... I've found that some heat is being directed in my way. Well, we kind of broke Felix out, so I we, suppose that is a crime we did commit. Well, I did ask you to. So I wear some of the blame. I mean, yeah, to be fair, me, Ben Gordon, Bergeron, we did commit a crime. Felix is the only innocent one here, technically. As an escapee from 
one of the holding cells and, well... And punching a woman. <clears throat> we all know where this is going. Look, the point is... I think it's time for you guys to vacate. Perhaps spend some time in the country. Yes. Take in the fresh air of the meadows. All that rot. That sounds like an ideal location for me. Undercliff is a very large region. Perhaps you can spend some time laying low there. In doing so, I may be able to give you some superficial disguises that you can use to vacate the town upon a trade wagon. They won't last long, but they'll last long enough. Felix told us this. Raj was here. Was she here for anything specific? He looks directly at you, Felix. And he says, Oh, Felix, will know that Siraj was in quite a rush because she had an emergency she needed to discuss with me. But fear not, I'm, I'm sorting the situation. Your main priority, your concern, is making yourself available for this odyssey again. And you can't do that while there is a price on all of your heads. So yeah. please, give me some time. I'll smooth this over with a guard. I'll prove Felix's innocence. And then we can tackle this new problem at full strength. Do you have something for us to do in Undercliff? Or are we just kind of going there for a holiday? I've well, got a house there. We can live in it. I probably wouldn't stay in a place that you used to reside. It might be a place they would look for you. Mm. That's the first place I'd look you're, for you. You're, you're a very good thief, aren't you, Halrod? No. <laughs> There might be some people in the city limits and in the village of Undercliff that could use your help if you do, in fact, get bored, but I'm sure that it... Well, it'd be a nice change of pace, put it that way, if I'm trying to put it positively. Yep, I'm I'm all for that. Just uh, uh, As much as I, I love being in the Valley of Odyssey and I love the people here, I, I need to move on for a bit. He nods and he I says... Need, I need to get away from Zen, to be honest. <laughs> he's he's quite one-track-minded when he wants to be... I didn't actually see him this morning either. He wasn't in his room early, early morning. Is he's he spent again? most of his time in his observation tower. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, that's fair. He's rarely left it. This cipher has taken up much of his time. He's getting obsessed. He, too, needs to leave. But... This cipher. It's a code of letter... <laughs> Doesn't fucking matter. Look, you all will await the arrival of the trade wagon, which will come around the back of the ruined building of the Odyssey. You use your disguises to jump aboard. Those that were riding on the trade wagon in will come into the building and you will take their place. You will then exit and take the shipment to Undercliff, where you will reside for... Until you hear word from me. It sounds like a good plan to me. Anything? Would, do we need to know what's on this shipment in the wagon? It's, it's just, uh, just the general goods. The wagon is returning to Undercliff after delivering us. Oh, perfect! Some produce. Just trying to trying to trying to get our story sorted. A very smart move. You'll need these. And you watch as he moves into his spell book and takes four of the pages that he had been transcribing and slides them across to you. Um, Bagram, looking at these, you can see that they're arcane scrolls. He says to you, These will disguise you for an hour, which will be just enough time for the wagon to exit the city through the river gate. What, no glasses and plastic nose? If you wish, that can be your disguise, Halrod. But I'd suggest something a little more conspicuous. Yeah, something to actually cover that uh, glossy head of yours. Just don't make me out to be a woman. I can't look like my mother. <laughs> I thought you already did. Arden says to you guys, if you do encounter any resistance from the City Watch, especially from Melnan Wargon, please try to negotiate. Don't engage. Don't make my job harder than it needs to be. I stare at Felix. What? I didn't kill anyone, did I? Gentlemen, promise one way or another, I will 
manage this for you. And when you come back, we can help Siraj. Okay. Prep your things. The wagon will be here in an hour. I get up and I was like, I'm sure a little bit of arcane magic could get rid of that scuff there. You watch as he looks in the direction of it and looks back to you and you watch as there is a small blue spark that appears on it and then it is immediately cleaned over. Looks beautiful. All right. And I turn it and I head out. Cape billowing as you do. All the bro. Yep. We all exit. All of Halrod. <laughs> Just as you leave, he looks to you, Halrod, and he says, Halrod. Yes, Arden. I like the do. Time for a change. He nods and you leave. You tend to yourselves for the next hour prepping what you need to from the Valiant Odyssey in order to make this trip. Is there anything that you would bring? So my pack is already pretty much set. I leave it always packed, ready to go on adventures. So I'll just finish up what I was doing for Bengor, which was forging and like making my new weapon. So you can definitely begin the process of that. Oh, over three days, you probably would have finished it. So mm. what would you have made? So Bengor, on the first day, he wanted to be able to um, have a blade that he could hide on him at all times, so I made a bracer into a hidden damn dagger for him. Cool. You now have a hidden dagger bracer as it is given to you. It looks like a leather wrap. Oh, actually, describe what it looks like for us, Howard. So it's a, it's a, a leather bracer like an archer would wear, but it, it's full. It's a full one instead of just laced up and with leather straps across it. And he can pull his um, hand back and a blade comes out from underneath. And it's kind of like Assassin's Creed. Very good. So as you get it, Bengal, you sort of watch it come out and then watch it come back in. It's very finely crafted and the blade itself looks strong. Just don't get your finger in the way you'll lose it. Thanks, Harrod. This looks amazing. That's what I do around here. You should have seen Key's weapon that I made of him. What did you make him? I made him a dagger whip. What would you like to do before you leave? Uh, I just, I know I need a couple of, um, health potions and kind of just a few things like that just to travel with, so I don't have any, so. You managed to get three of those health potions. Yep. As the delivery comes from Rashal's. So mark that off on your inventory. As you enter your room as well, you look towards the dresser and you can see the pyramid puzzle sitting there. Heavy still opened in its floral pattern. Its glyphs and runes de-illuminated. Uh, yeah, definitely that comes with me. I kind of, I pack that away as well as the, I've also got sitting right beside us the sword hilt. Uh, and the sword hilt was what I gathered, basically it was from my first contract that I had taken out well, when I came to the material plane. Uh, it's just a kind of reminder of um, basically a failed contract and that basically kind of I'm responsible for anything that I end up doing. Okay. So, And that's kind of basically the two of them together are kind of a reminder, ongoing reminder as I go throughout my entire travels as to kind of basically things that have happened, things that I've done and the, um, the flow on effect of any decision I make and therefore I need to kind of really think and make the decisions correctly. Very contemplative as you begin packing your bag and you eventually make your way out to see Halrod and Bangor conversing. Is there anything you would like to pack or do, Felix? Felix didn't rock up with too much at the Odyssey, so he pretty much just has his his bag that he usually has. But since everyone else is like sort of doing stuff, he just takes the time to just see how much money he has. So he empties out his purse and counts his ten silver and uh, 10 silver and eight, uh, seven gold. Put it back in the bag again. And just waits out the back. All right. So as you move those coins into the bag, you watch as Bera, the gnome, moves past you and looks at you as you're doing it on the table and she just goes, <laughs> is that it? Uh, is what, what, sorry? You should play some gambling games with Bagram. You could double that. He's really bad. Ooh. So, and what would I do with it? 
you give it to me. Ah. Uh, okay. You're you're a cute cat. And you watch as she moves away. Thank thank you. You eventually make your way out the back, and you watch as the back door opens. And the smell of ash hits your nose. As you look around, you can see the varying evidence of a previous um, burnt down wreck, which was the Odyssey. You can see stones and pieces of wood that are still piled up in the area. And then as you look behind you, an immaculate building. You both step out into the sunlight for the first time in three days and you just soak that in. As the door closes behind you, you look and you can see a shimmer move up the Valiant Odyssey building and then it completely disappears and you can see directly over to the other side of the street through the wreck. It's at that point you watch as this wagon drawn by a heavy Clydesdale horse moves from the back of the Odyssey and into your peripheries. You watch as four individuals jump off, two halflings and two um, humans. They immediately jump off they move towards you and you watch as they start to size you guys up, these four people. You watch as the two humans go towards the tabaxi and uh, the eladrin elf and you watch as they're sort of comparing heights visually and then you watch as they swap and then they both take off their cloaks and give them to you and they walk into the Odyssey laughing. The two halflings move over to you and as they look towards you, you watch as one of them says, oh, I hope this fits you. And they take the cloaks off and put them back onto you as well. And you watch as the two halflings walk in. You watch as one of them says, you're round. And the door closes and the sound of the Odyssey is mute from you. You look and see the wagon. Barrels in the back, completely emptied. Seemingly the load already been unloaded around the side. You can see the horse ready and waiting. Him being six foot is the halfling. Halfling clothes won't fit him. At the moment, the halfling clothes on him look like very unfitted. The parchment we got from Arden, mm -hmm. is it just like a scroll of like polymorph or something? Disguise self. So you can look and you've taken some time now to look into that and you can see that it's going to last an hour and it's going to be able to visually make you look different. But if somebody investigates that illusion, it's not a particularly strong one. How different? But it's not like polymorph where you can change like, your, like, change like a lizard or something. You can change into a different looking humanoid, but somebody that engages with you. They, they touch the area. Yeah. It's like so can I disguise myself? Could, would I be able to disguise myself as just a house cat? Mm, no, it has to be a humanoid. Has to be humanoid. Yeah. 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 No. Um, so Bangor could indeed disguise himself as a halfling, but if anybody moved over that form and touched above where the halfling is, they would feel Bangor. If you know what I mean, because he's taller. Who we swapped over and. I, I I look at the kind of the tallest one there, thin one. I was like, all right, and I read it. So I use the scroll and roll an arcana check. As the only <laughs> magical member of the party bagram. Yep. Arcana is a 19. Okay, so with your 19, you watch as the other three members of your party are attempting to read their scrolls too. You read yours successfully you watch as the parchment glows blue and then disappears in a fractal of energy similar to what you've seen uh, Arden use before it's almost like shattering glass you move over to Felix and he's not making heads of tails for it so you cast it on him I, move did, I use my mage hand yep. just cause <laughs> you move over to Halrod <laughs> I touch each one of them and cast it on them mm -hmm. and you see Halrod is uh, reading his but when you move over to Bengal he's got his like upside down you turn it the right way and then you watch as all three of them simultaneously ch -ch -ch smash. Then from head to toe, you watch as you're disguised. What do you all look like now? Oh, great. I'm a midget. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at Halrod, halfling, I'm guessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to go about, about the same size. All right. Bengal? I'm just going to look like a uh, normal human being. Yep. But I'm going to have uh, long black hair, a thick beard and mustache. And I'm also going to have a glass spectacle on my right eye. Very cool. And Felix, what are you looking at? Uh, 
I look just like a dirty stable hand, mm-hmm. but like a, like a tall, like one of those tall, lanky kids you know you see like in high schools and stuff like that. There's always that one tall, lanky kid. Yeah, I'm sort of like How that. With, that yeah. yeah, with scraggly, like uh, dirty blonde hair and just sort of like hunched over and very quiet. Cool. And Bagram? Uh, I look like a distinguished uh, businessman, just kind of a BCO, a, a, a human. Uh, just kind of very, very kind of put together and just kind of look like basically a relatively rich individual. So we're yeah. in charge and there are servants. <laughs> basically. Well, I, I'm just kind of, I'm just hitching a ride in the wagon to Undercliff to continue some business. All right. All right. You look towards each other, disguise is taking place. Knowing this only takes an hour, you load yourselves up onto the horse. Who's driving? I guess I'll drive. Not the stable hand? Good no, point. I'm the boss. He has to jump off and cart the items. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, um, you all jump onto the cart. Roll an animal handling check, please, Halrod. Oh, this could be bad. Fifteen. Fifteen. You watch as the horse stubbornly stays where it is, but eventually after you you uh, <laughs> whip the reins once or twice, it begins to move through the city streets of Cadmia. You look around and you can see people going about their daily business. You can see people in the North Ward that seem to be meandering through. And as you pass by the front of the Odyssey, leaving the cul-de-sac, you can see as well that some people have come and laid flowers where um, Felix had laid his wooden animal replica for Turi. As you see that, and you begin to make your way out into the streets, heading southward, you begin to look to the left and the right, and you can see the large towering statues that reside in this city made of marble. As you look through and see them, you can also see the sunlight cresting off of them as people begin to meander through bringing their trade goods as they continue their day. You do look up and on the left you can see a griffin rider perched on a particular post designed for these riders. And as you look at that, he's just scanning the area. As he looks towards you. Can I tell if he's using any sort of arcane means? Roll an arcana check. I'm just going to keep riding down the street. Oh, there's nothing to uh, see here. <laughs> just say 11. He just seems to be looking with his eyes. There doesn't appear to be any arcane source guiding his vision. He looks towards you guys, and as a cart passes the opposite way to what you're going, you both sort of cross paths, and the watchman actually looks down to both carts and gives a signal as if to say, top of the morning to both, both carts, and you watch as the driver that's passing by waves to the guard. As he looks towards you, Halrod, and does a similar gesture. I way back and I was like, top of the morning to you. And just keep going. All right. As you begin going down, you pass by the walls that house the city of the dead. And you can see people moving into that area to pay their respects, but also converse in the park or go for a leisurely walk. You begin making your way to the river gate and you can see on that gate, there are three guardsmen that seem to be just standing in the watchtower area. They seem to be stopping some people, but letting most go. I'd like you all to roll deception checks with advantage, please. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck. <clears throat> I rolled a nat one the first time. I rolled a two. <laughs> that would have been a short adventure. That would have been a very short adventure. 15. 21. 16. Uh, 21. Okay, so all of you maintaining your disguises, not paying too much attention to yourselves. He watches the three guards begin conversing with this older gentleman that seems to be moving out of the city. And as he does that, you take the opportunity to meander through with your horse, clopping at a leisurely pace through the river gate and onto the river road. As you begin moving through, you exhale. (sighs) You look behind you. The city of Cadmir in your wake. The city that wants to imprison you. The city that also holds answers for a lot of you. The freedom and the sunlight is felt by every single one of you having spent a little bit of time in the Odyssey Guild and you couldn't imagine if that time was extended due to a prison sentence, especially one that you don't deserve. You begin moving over the rolling hills. Sparse wooded areas of trees begin to mottle your path. You watch as the path meanders downward off of the plateau that Cadmir resides upon. You knowing the way to Undercliff quite well, Halrod, being to and from a multiple amounts of times, turn the cart to the north 
And as you do in the distance, you can see the first instance of what looks like harvested fields. You take a deep inhale and you can smell that fresh farm air. But as you do that, and everyone does around you, can you all roll a perception check for me, please? 15. 12. 15. 21. So with your bestial senses, Halrod, and being somebody who often inhales as you enter Undercliff to get the whole vibe of the place, it smells the same, it smells like home. There's something musky, an undertone that isn't usually there. You recognize the scent to be flesh rotting in the sun a fair distance away. And as you scan in the area where you think it comes from, you can see a few mottles of black that seem to be hovering above, circling almost like vultures or carrion birds that seem to be surrounding something probably about 200 or so feet off to the left of the road. How far from Undercliff are we at the moment? You're probably halfway there. It only takes about an hour to go by cart. Gentlemen, there's something going on up ahead. I think we should investigate on our way. Well, gives us something to do at least. Mm. There's a awkward, there's a smell like rot on the air and there's birds hovering. Well, that's never a good combination. No, it's not. Oh, we'll, we'll have a look at it on our way past and see Is what's there any going on. Farms you know of that's over that way? Oh, there's farms all the way from Cadmia to Undercliff. They're just scattered to and there, and then as you get towards Undercliff, they're more concentrated. You know, most of the ones over on the eastern side are produce, and some of the ones across to the north are more pastoral. Pastoral, yes. Thank you. So as you guys begin traveling, you look towards this area and you move your cart off the road slightly, Halrod, moving the horse into a stall. The wheels of this cart stop and you guys take a moment to stretch your legs. As you jump off, the tall grass of the hillside just whipping at your shins, you all then begin to smell what Halrod had initially smelled. It's that undertone of rot that just is like, it's not as offensive as it would be, if you were standing right there, but it's definitely present. You look to the sky and you can see dipping and then moving around is also some birds which you do recognize to be vultures. Two of them seem to be particularly big. Is it clear to where we're going or is it a tree? Uh, it's pretty to- clear, but it's a you're standing at the base of a hillside, which you would then need to traverse. Right. And then uh, whatever this is, is in the valley beyond. We'll check right. out what's happened here. Yeah, just we got cl- to. climb the hill, see what's happening up there. Okay. You begin climbing the hill, trudging one foot after the other. You get to the crest of it and you all begin to peer down through the long grass. You can see there's probably about six or so vultures that seem to be picking at various different lumps lying in the grass. As you look at that area, you get to the top of the hill. Would you be approaching further or looking from where you are? I have a spyglass in my backpack. We'll check it out from a distance first before we get closer. Uh, Newton can also uh, be a hawk or an owl, and I can kind of cruise in there, see what's going on. I deploy Newton. Deploy Newton. All right. All right. At that point, you two can roll perception checks with advantage as Newton runs down your arm and as he jumps off into the air, transforms into a flying owl. 10. And Halrod? 19. Through the light of the sun, you're unable to see much through Newton's eyes as the owl moves its way up. And you can see as well that the birds of prey are definitely vultures. And as you, Halrod, begin spying through the spyglass... You look at the lumps, and as one of the vultures moves out of the way, you can see a carcass that seems to be there. Rib cage splayed open. You can see a quadrupedal-looking animal that seems to have horns on top of its head. You recognize it to be a goat. As you look at it, and you look at the rest of the the smatterings of, of masses that seem to be through this area, there's probably about a dozen or so that seem to just be completely torn apart and ripped open. But it looks like something's massive to cut a bunch of goats down there, but I don't know from what I can see through my spyglass. Thank God, I thought it was people or somebody else. Well, that's the <sighs> worst case scenario, but... That's what I was thinking. The point is, if the goats have been there left long enough for vultures to come and pick at them, it means there's no humans down there either. Yeah, did, did you see a um, any uh, buildings or anything that somebody would live around that area? This seems to be an open valley of hillside. Um, to the north you guys see uh, various different crops 
that uh, indicate people would probably live there. So at the moment, shall we just go see if we can find the owners of these goats or the? Um, I might quick take a quick duck down there and see if I can determine what killed these things. Can you do that? Well, he, look at least he okay. is. The, he is the fast cat. He's the. Well, I know he can get there fastly, but I didn't know if we could uh, see what killed him. I was going to say, how can Hunter. you scan the rest of the area, see if anything's hiding, lurking? I'll be bait, and I'll <laughs> run down there. He yeah. begins running. You can roll a perception check, Halrod. I'll say Newton comes back to you as well. That's cock roll that again. Is cock, yeah. um, actually, I'm going to continue send Newton actually into that pastoral area towards the buildings and stuff. Okay. Uh, that's a 24. All right, so looking around, you can see that there do appear to be birds of prey that are picking from these carcasses in terms of actual people or villainous things ravenous beasts there doesn't appear to be anything lurking in the high grass you do then look seeing that the coast is clear and you can look down and you'll meet your spyglass cuts to where felix is just cutting down the the plane kind of want to do like what pumba does in lion king like charge at the buzzards and try and chase them away <laughs> all right roll an intimidation <laughs> nice. check as you run <laughs> I should have left uh, Newton as a uh, weasel and put him on his back. <laughs> uh, 12. 12. As you begin running through the, the grass, you do that cat prowl until you get to a certain point where the tall grass is just wavy enough for you to just start piss bolting. And as you do, you flap your arms around, wave them as hard as you can. You watch as three of the vultures sort of fly away, but the bigger one just stands its ground and looks at you. You watch as it cocks its head slowly and that's sort of the neck flesh that isn't quite tight is all like wrinkly and just sort of wobbles as it looks at you and you watch as it blinks its eye. Is it a normal looking vulture? It's, it's big, but it looks normal. Okay. <sighs> you watch as it stands atop this carcass and flaps its wings and makes the sound a vulture makes. It's just Peter's, like... Ah! Peter's going to be pissed, but I'm going to kick it. <laughs> all right, roll in. <laughs> roll in his hack. <laughs> Whack it with your stick, Felix! Uh, 18 to hit. So it definitely hits all your damage. Uh, seven points of damage. Okay, so as you move towards it, there's a staring contest. And then the silence is broken. And I feel like it's a long shot of you just <laughs> sparta kicking this vulture. And as you hit it, you watch as it just like cause flies off and flaps away. You can see down where it stood the corpse of a goat. Roll a nature check. Seven. It's definitely dead. <laughs> As you look at it, it doesn't look like the vultures were the cause of death. That's what you can determine. But what you do notice as well that this was a savage killing. Can I use my sense of smell to see if, like, say, like, smell of like, like dog fur, like wet dog, like scent or anything like that? Perception check. 25 definitely get this smell of rot and as you look down into the corpse you can see it's open rib cage most of its organs seem to be completely gone and you can see them partially eaten you can see maggots taking out this area seems to wet the grass that smell hits you immediately but you also get the smell of saliva but there doesn't appear to be any sort of smell of dog like lingering around if you if you will um, looking at this as well judging by the scent it's probably about a week or so old. So any scent that you may have been able to smell would have we definitely go. dissipated by now. But that's what you're able to tell from your score, the, the duration of time that this has been in the sun for. And as you look around, there appears to be, as as before, about a dozen or so of these similar looking corpses. Are there any like gash marks in the corpses? As you look at them, there are some, but it appears that they were made, they're, they're more puncture wounds then a slash, which you uh, assume to be teeth. Like donut-sized puncture wounds or? Probably small. the size of, it's definitely like a, a humanoid size like a or a wolf size kind of thing. It would be as if like a German Shepherd or something bit something. All right, so it's not, it's yeah. not like a giant yeah. creature. Yeah. Or and you can like. also see as well, there de seems to be a, a deep puncture wound on either side of the bite indicating some canines or some sharp teeth. Uh, and there seems to be some ripping and some lashing from that as well, as if some incisors occurred. Only one puncture set? No, multiple. Oh. On this one. As you look towards an adjacent 
goat, you can see similar sort of features, but roll a perception check as you scan the rest. You don't see the wolf sneak up on you. No. <laughs> Ten. Ten. Um, you notice that they're all in various states of rot. This one that you're looking at seems to have been fed upon quite ravenously. But some of them don't appear to be fed don't. upon at all. Some of them just seem to be killed and left. So more killed for sport rather than food. You see an element of both. They defi- If this was like a predatorial kill... Most of the time they kill what they need, eat it, and leave. Mm. This looks like they killed what they need, eat it, and then kept going. Yeah. Okay. I'll head back up. Mm -hmm. He comes back with a musty smell of rot on his fur from being in proximity. It's kind of gross down there. It looks like it. All right. So whatever killed these, killed and ate some of them, but some of them are less ravaged. And look like they're just being killed because they were in the area. Can you make any sense out or anything particular I mean, smell? No, it looks like it's been about a week since they've been dead. Mm. Mm. There are puncture wounds from something biting it with like canines, but I can't tell if it was dog, wolf, wolf etc. What? I wonder what the full moon was like. Roll a nature check. 14. Okay, so the cycle of Selene, you're probably a few weeks off a of full moon. Right. It's definitely, it's not even close to a new moon. No, you're in the middle of the moon. cycle, yeah. Mm. Um, but it doesn't seem like a normal bridge, like a bridge kill. It seems like it was a bridge kill, and then just a kill for fun. And afterwards. then a frenzy. You definitely get the vibe of hunger and anger through this kill. Look. Uh, um, there was no humans around, so we'll, we'll um, maybe we should just stop at the next oh. house we see. Newton's just flown off to um, basically the, the, past the pasture to the, the farmhouses there, and he should be on his way back hopefully shortly to just kind of depend on how he acts. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll know if we need to head that way or not. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not really in the uh, the business of goat disposal. So we'll head towards that farmhouse and moving on towards Undercliff. Yeah, I reckon the vultures will help it. We'll take care of the disposal. Mm. You have this conversation as you jump back onto the wagon, and as you begin taking off, Newton does indeed come back, and he seems to be acting quite normal. Okay. No, it doesn't seem to be any issues at that at the farmhouse, so Newton just kind of sits on my shoulder, and we continue on the ride. All right, so we'll just head to Undercliff. Let's go. Get around the corner and everything's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> as you take on oh. north. Newton just doesn't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Newton don't care. Newton don't give a fuck. I imagine the meme of, you know that girl looking and there's a house on fire? Yeah. That's just like Newton the weasel. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, right. all normal. Yeah. <laughs> you begin taking the winding road through the valley and hills up towards Undercliff. And as you do, you pass by the farmhouse and you can see that it seems to be intact. Crops still intact. Do we want to stop and see if these uh, they own the goats? It might be a of us to at least mention it. Yeah. Especially if there's something in the area. Doing hey, this. you're terrible farmers. Your goats have been dead for a week. <laughs> well, well, yeah. well, at least then they could know. Because no one's doing anything about it. There's just something though. running around killing a lot of things. All right, yeah. all right, all right, all right. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go knock. Yeah, we'll, send right. the, we'll send the midget. You watch as... <laughs> oh, I imagine that's one off by now. Uh, you watch then as the... <laughs> Still short. You watch then as the... the Wagon comes to a halt. Halrod, you jump off and begin walking towards the door. And as you get there, you knock on the door. And as you knock on the door, it's at that moment your hand changes from a halfling hand back to a dwarven hand, a big fat dwarven hand. I liked my skinny hands. You watch as opening the door seems to be a man in his 40s or 50s. You can see him wearing a leather vest. You can see that he's got a little bit of a pot belly and you can see he's got a dagger at his belt. And you can see he's got an open shirt, some chest hairs protruding through some bags under his eyes and he says can I help you hello sir I'm Boris Goldstone I don't know if you know about the goats down the way but there's some dead goats being preyed on by vultures I saw the the vultures hovering in the sky I went to check it out a few days ago seems like something really tore those goats apart you don't know anything about it they're not yours no they're they're wild goats they roam these lands there's plenty more where that came from I tell you that 
It's the manner of the kill that concerns me. It was it was quite savage. Yeah, we uh, we investigated, and uh, it was it was like a frenzy killing for fun, basically. Mm, that that's a worry. I um I don't own any livestock myself. I'm fruit and veg strictly. Ah, uh, in these times, it's probably a good idea not to own <laughs> animals. In times like this, it is. Hey, you're Halrod. I afraid you're mistaken. My name is Boris Goldstone. I work for the. No, Gold no, I. I frequent Undercliff. You're talked about quite a lot there. You came uh, by a week or so ago. Sorry about the loss of your um group. We loved him very much. Um, group was a good man. And he died a hero for Undercliff. He nods and he says, I can attest to that. Always paid his way at the pub and would have a conversation with me when he needed to. Loved Mardol, served her well. We Look. all did, and he was he died protecting Mardol's sanctuary. I'll say a prayer for him today. You heading back to Undercliff? Yeah, we got some business out that way for now. He smiles and he says, they'll be happy to see you there. You're always welcome. Yeah, I, I thought I'd try and disguise myself and shave my head, but apparently it's not working. Well, Kent, um, he gestures towards the beard. Ah, says, that was the problem. We do get some dwarves that uh, come by Undercliff, but none as famous as you. Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? He shakes his head and he says, I don't think so. Your reputation is a good one. Well, maybe where I'm going, but not where I'm coming from. I don't think there's a soul in Undercliff that would turn you into anybody that's looking for him. That's, that's a relief to know. He nods and he says, It's good to meet you. Likewise. Look after yourself and stay safe. I will. Thanks for letting us know about the goats. That was a uh, good Samaritan thing you did there. Uh, if I'm always in a position to help people, I will. He nods and he says, here. And he hands you over a basket full of corn. Oh, thanks much. I can make some cornbread. He says, my wife makes some good cornbread, but hopefully you can do something with this. That's uh, all I can offer you. So. That's all right. I'll be able to feed the lads anyway. He bids you farewell. He shuts the door. You return to the cart with a basket full of corn. Guys, my disguise has worn off. And it's apparently dope. people know exactly who I am even though I shaved my head. Yeah, very yeah. noticeable. Yeah, wh why did we send... Well, to be an advantage. The guy reveres me, so, you know. I oh, need... okay. Hmm. That's good. That's good to know. And it's at that stage you watch as the other three <laughs> turn back into exactly who they look like. Ah, bibbidi bobbidi Boop. <laughs> you begin pushing the cart forward and you pass by uh, the lake on the eastern side of Undercliff Village and as you do and you roll around the last bend you see the village some of you for the first time as you look towards the village you can see the buildings are quite simple they're hay across the roof you can see most of them are wooden make but some are stone uh, you can see the roads are mostly dirt with some cobblestone patched throughout. You can see lots of hobby farms throughout this area. And you also see three of the largest buildings seem to be directly in the center of town. One that seems to be quite quite illustrious, made of wood. And you can see that there is a large staghorn across the head of it. And uh, that's the temple to Mardol. You also look to see an inn that seems to be bustling with uh, occupation and population. You can see a large boar across the sign, and you know this to be the boar's head. And there's another building as well that you seem to be like government chambers, and you can see a stage that sort of emanates off of that. But you get a very big farming vibe from this. You pass by a few wells. You can see various different market stalls throughout the, the area, and it's quite a hilly uh, landscape. Think like Hobbiton, but the houses are above the ground. As you enter, and you pull your horses into Undercliff proper, we'll end the episode there. Hi guys, and thank you so much for listening to the latest episode, D&D Valiant Odyssey. In the future guys, if you want to catch up with us outside of the times that the episodes are released, you can come to our Discord. You should find the link in the show notes. If you want to catch up on all the announcements and keep up to date with the Valiant Odyssey action, then there's our socials link as well. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, we're there. 
Valiant Odyssey is growing and it's all because of you. So thank you so much for your patronage. Make sure you leave a review on your favorite podcast medium. We'll see you next week. Welcome to the Odyssey.